it's now my profound pleasure to introduce our, our first speaker of the day, Elisa Fink. I'm going to sound like a fanboy here. Elisa is the chief marketing officer of Tableau Software, uh, a business analytics company that I think is, is really changing the way that people interact with data. We at the University of Washington are early on in our engagement with Tableau, but I, I don't think I've been this excited about a product or a piece of software since uh, Call of Duty <laughs> Modern Warfare 2 came out. Uh, it, it, it's just, it's been great to work with. At least I can't imagine what it's like. It's got to be great to have the job of marketing Tableau. I mean, that's like uh, marketing rainbows and ice cream and three-day weekends, I think. I don't know, I, you know, I don't want to say your job is easy. I've seen your travel schedule, but this is a really, really good product. Um, I asked Bob to throw up on the screen here the Gartner Research Magic Quadrant. This just came out last week, actually. And two things I want to point out about this. One, I'm not really sure how rigorously Gartner uh, tested the software they were evaluating, because if they had, they probably would not have come up with such an ugly chart. Um, <laughs> but the thing I want to point out is that Tableau has actually moved to essentially pole position in that all-important leadership quadrant. And, uh, you know, from year to year, Gartner kind of tries to increase their expectations on the, on the, the bottom axis there, which is their, uh, their completeness or their ability to execute goes up and then the, the completeness of vision. Tableau was one of only two companies on that chart that actually moved to the right. Everyone else moved to the left. So uh, congratulations for that. So I hadn't met Elisa uh, when Chris asked me to introduce her. Uh, so when I you know, knew I'd be doing that, I did the logical thing and began surveilling her on the internet. And I learned some interesting things. One, I apparently, Elisa has a reputation for being late to meetings. I know this because on her Twitter feed, she keeps a, uh, a running tally of her on-time, non-on-time stats. I think you're, at last check, you're at about 70%. So... Yeah, so I, I was thinking I was, might have to stall up here, so that's why I wrote some stuff down. Um, but we share that special skill, by the way. A uh, couple other things we share in common. We both have English degrees, one. Two, we both managed to get jobs anyway. So that's good. Elisa started her career at the Wall Street Journal, um, selling advertising, where she relied on market research data to profile subscribers. And from there, she really became a marketing specialist. She's held VP and director positions within several software companies focused on consumer insights, business intelligence, map data, financial services data. Uh, indeed, her entire career has been marked by a theme of data. And it turns out Elisa was actually a customer of Tableau before she joined the company in 2007, uh, when she was the executive VP and chief marketing officer for IXI. I actually watched an interview where she described the thrill of using Tableau for the first time and just knowing immediately that this was a, a company that she had to be a part of. Um, so we are so pleased to have Elisa here to talk about the just amazing power of data and the incredible things that can happen when we're able to view data in new and creative ways. So please give a warm drive wel welcome to Elisa Fake. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. That was an incredible introduction. Um, yes, we English majors are great marketers. And Michael, if you're looking for a marketing job, let's talk, because that was some great marketing of both Tableau and my, uh, my background. So thank you so much. First of all, I just want to tell you what a pleasure it is for me to be here. Um, and I, um, I'm a little sick, and I wasn't able to join you yesterday because I wanted to save my energy for here. But I've been watching this conference. I think I first uh, learned about it last year. And to see how it's grown and the kind of people that are here and also the kind of content that's being put together here is just amazing. I'm so impressed. Um, because in fact, when I, when I first encountered the conference and I read the website, 
I just felt a really special kinship with this conference, with the people organizing it and the, the attendees. Um, it's, a, it's a conference that's bringing together, as it says on the website, a passionate community of professionals who all care about the art and science of data. Boy, those are words that we at Tableau could have written. Um, and so again, it's really just a pleasure to be able to talk to you today about the power of data because we, like you, believe in data. We believe that it can help change the world. It helps people every day in their professional and personal lives, and it can make big changes in the greater world. So let's get this, start, this talk started by talking and looking at a little bit of data. Here, as you see, is a simple structured table of data, the kind we all use every day. Looks pretty simple, uh, obviously looks like some health data, some births and deaths. Um, it's from 1849, and it's very important data. Can you see what it's trying to tell you? What it's trying to tell us is that there are germs in the world, microscopic organisms that cause disease, that make us sick. This wasn't well known at all. And in fact, there were many theories of disease prior to this set of data. Um, it, it's a data set that told us that, hey, doctors who wash their hands between seeing patients to, uh, prevent the spread of disease. In fact, it was discovered by Ignaz Samelweis. He was a doctor in a hospital in Vienna. And he had missed a, uh, getting a prestigious appointment at a university and instead took a job at a hospital where he had a couple of clinics. There was a clinic, one let's call it, that was um, seen to or seen over by doctors and trained professionals and medical students, and another clinic that was uh, attended to by midwives. And it was common knowledge in the community that Clinic 1, where they had trained professionals, had higher death rates at birth than Clinic 2. And this troubled Ignaz when he joined the hospital. It was his first year. He couldn't figure out how a clinic that had highly, more highly trained people would have less success rates at birth. And so he started looking at historical data. And he started taking things apart and, and chasing hunches and being very interested in what this data could tell him. And what he realized is that, yes, washing your hands between seeing patients, in fact, would reduce the death rate of babies at birth. The sad thing is that he had, took him many years to convince people of this. But in fact, his great discovery changed the world as we know it and laid the foundation for the germ theory of disease. He saved probably hundreds of millions of lives with that incredible discovery. Let's look at another little bit of data. This is data from um, Stephen Levitt, uh, an economist um, and a professor in the Chicago area, University of Chicago, I believe. He wrote the book Freakonomics. And this data is actually test answers for students um, taking tests. A letter indica indicates a correct uh, uh, test answer, and a number indicates an incorrect test answer. And it, too, is trying to tell you something. And maybe some of you maybe know a little bit about this data if you've read Freakonomics. In fact, what it's trying to tell us is that there were 200 teachers in the Chicago public school system that were cheating. They were changing the scores of their students so their students would perform better, and the teachers would get better evaluations, and they would earn more incentives. Very important finding, and you can see it in this data if you look at it just right. Another set of data here, very small, very innocent. It's actually the attributes of just 25 stars. And it, too, can tell us something amazing, really kind of world changing. These 25 stars can tell us how to measure the size of the universe, the cosmos. It can tell us that this data can help us measure the distance to all stars, the distance to other galaxies, and in fact, our place in our galaxy. Imagine now a, a woman back in 1912, making these, this incredible discovery. It was Henrietta Leavitt who did it. She was a brilliant scientist, but in fact, she wasn't called a scientist at the time. She was really more a data researcher, because in 1912, women were not considered scientists. That what they did, what Henrietta and her colleagues did, was poured over photographs of the night sky and took measurements of stars and other bodies um, of the sky. In fact, what they were called, oddly enough, was computers, because they computed calculations and distances from this data, from these images, and created data. 
Now, Henrietta was like so many of us and so many people since the dawn of mankind, looking up at the stars at night and wondering, what are those stars? How many are there? How far away are there? What is out there? What's our place in all of this? Was an unanswered question for most of history when you think about it. Until Henrietta had an intuition to focus on those 25 stars and look at him this way with the measurements that she collected off the photographic film and then visualize it this way where she saw that brightness and period or distance you could say helped, helped calculate how far away those stars were. Well this did in fact change astronomy, her discovery. In fact later giants in the industry like Hubble of the, uh, who was, the Hubble telescope was named after, really recognized the importance of Henrietta's contributions to astronomy and to the sciences in general. In fact, it was him and maybe some colleagues that wanted to nominate her for Nobel Prize, but in fact, um, she had passed away and couldn't, couldn't take it um, because only living scientists could win a Nobel Prize. But what an amazing discovery for what's known as a computer to make, a human computer. We're here because we all are like these people. We believe in the power of using data to get insight. And it's just like how these people did it. And it's worth asking, how did they do it? How do people think with data and come across amazing discoveries? How do they use the power of data? Well, in each of these examples, it was people that had questions. They were in a field that they had concerns about. Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, Semmelweis, Ignaz, concerned about birth and death rates in his hospital. Data held the clue there. Stephen Levitt, examining uh, test data and asking questions, what was going on there? And even Henrietta with her 25 stars and the attributes of stars. How are discoveries like this made? What are these people doing that makes them so different and better than a lot of their colleagues that they baffle? Let's take a look at some of these questions because it's not that the people who make these amazing discoveries are all that different than you and I. They have something in common. It's not just that they use data because lots of people use data. It's not that they have better computer programs or that they know how to com program a computer. In fact, a lot of the people in the stories we'll talk about today didn't even have computers in their day. And it's not even that they're smarter. Most of them would say they stood on the shoulders of giants that came before them. No, there's something else that's different about these people, something different about the way they think and use data. What is it that great thinkers do with data? The thing that comes to mind, a couple of qualities. First of all, the thing that great minds do with data is they combine logic and facts with gut, with intuition. They care about deduction, and of course, they have processed uh, ways of uh, coordinating data and looking at data. But they're not afraid to feel through their data and trust their feelings about which way to go with their data. They also rely on structure of a process or an analysis. But they're also not afraid to improvise. In fact, they're happy to go off the road of the right, right way to do analytics. Improvising is an important part of what they do. And finally, they're able to combine the discipline of the sciences with the creativity of the arts. Let's look at a couple of these particular uh, types of great thinkers and examine, really, what are the great characteristics. I'm going to tell you some more stories about some great thinkers with data. The great data people we're going to look at are like jazz artists. They are trained in the structure and language of their fields, for sure. They're deeply trained. They're deeply knowledgeable. They have all the facts at their disposal. But they do some things differently. They improvise like great jazz artists do. A great jazz musician can absolutely knows how to play from sheet music and create beautiful music. But the thing about great jazz artists is that they can improvise. They can play unpredictably and unplanned and, again, create a new stream of beautiful music. And that's what we think great minds do. A couple of qualities let's take a look at. We're going to look at them through the eyes of some of the great discoveries that we uh, see in the last 100 years. For example, if you think about Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was he schooled in science and mathematics? Did he know what he was talking about? Of course he did. But one of the things that's interesting about Albert Einstein, if you read a little bit about him, is that he was famous for his love of simplicity and harmony and beauty. 
He was famous for t working on problems and coming up with weeks of work and results and just throwing them out because it didn't seem right to him. He had an intuition. It just didn't feel right. He would do that. The guy who discovered the elemental laws of the universe actually said, there is no logic to discovering the elemental laws of the universe. There is only the way of intuition. It's pretty remarkable coming from someone, one of our greatest scientists, if not the greatest scientist of the 20th century. Another great characteristic is how great thinkers chase hunches. They chase the unexpected. This is Alexander Fleming, and he is the discoverer of antibiotics. He was known as a very disorderly, a disordered thinker. He would leave his lab space and his office and his desk in a big mess while everybody else was tidying up at the end of the day. He just felt like, hey, you never know when things are going to combine, or I'm going to see things differently, or I'm going to get something, an unexpected result. In fact, that's how he came to discover antibiotics. He actually uh, tidied up a little bit, piled some Petri dishes together before he left for a three-week vacation. He came back from that vacation, and he made his world-changing discovery. He wasn't looking to discover antibiotics. He was just writing a routine paper on bacteria. But when he came back and he saw one particular Petri dish, what he saw was a mold with a ring of clearness around it and then bacteria beyond that. And it, surprised him. It startled him. It was unexpected. What is this mold that seemed to be able to fight uh, back where a bacteria could not live around it? Well, he immediately dropped his paper and chased that hunch. And it turned out that he had discovered penicillium. Now, it took many years, decades, to make penicillin a useful medicine to mankind. But it would have never happened had Fleming not organized his work in a way that allowed him to chase unexpected hunches. Another great thing people with great insights do is they shift perspectives. When they're looking at data, they're thinking, well, what about this angle? What about that angle? What if I turn it upside down or inside out? Take the example of um, Dmitry Mendeleev. He was a great Russian chemist and produced one of the most important tables of information ever. He took this data here in this table and an involved thinking process, turned it into this table, and then he looked at it this way, and then this way, and finally this way. Now there's really no difference in the data from the, fit, the last thing you're seeing and the first thing I showed you, except that the way it's organized. It's the power of perspective shifting. And many of you have, have already see, are already seeing that this is in fact the table of periodic elements. It's how we know or learn about all the matter in our world today. The subatomic particles that make everything we do and everything we're about is represented in this table. We can discover new elements. We predict how elements interact. And most importantly, it brings back memories of horrible high school chemistry experiments. <laughs> At least it does for me. I was an English major, as Michael pointed out. Uh, lastly, another great way that thinkers, uh, great thinkers, another great quality of them is how they relate disparate information. How do they connect things on the fly that create new world-changing uh, observations that can change the world? This is Charles Darwin, and you all know who Charles Darwin is. But early in his career, at the tender age of 22, before he was known as a professional biologist or naturalist or scientist even, he got on a ship called the Beagle, a famous voyage that he took for five years, and not as a scientist and not as a biologist, but as a companion to uh, the, the couple of people on the ship. He was actually on track to become a pastor, a clergyman, and decided to take this voyage. And this is the ship that took him down to Argentina and the Galapagos, and he started seeing things. He was a meticulous observer of nature and human nature, and he started seeing amazing things and connecting them together. For example, one of the most interesting things he observed on this trip was that there was a commonality between these glyptodon fossils that they saw in the cliffs of Argentina and the armadillo that the boat, that people were eating at night on the boat. Yes, I said they were eating armadillo on the boat at night. Charles Darwin did record that it tastes like duck. I don't think you need to go find that out, but if you want to, 
probably armadillo l'orange would be pretty good. Anyway, what he discovered was that there was this incredible commonality between the bones on a plate at night on the ship and the work he was doing in the field. He also saw other commonalities while he was on this trip. He saw commonalities between uh, creatures that were extinct for tens of thousands of years and the three-toed sloth that was um, alive and well at that time. Now, prior to Darwin, it's kind of hard to believe this, but people believed prior to Darwin that God put animals in a particular place, a particular type of animal, and uh, that happened at creation, and they didn't change. So for, for him to come out of that kind of common knowledge or common belief and make these connections was a pretty remarkable thing. It's a lot like, in fact, a lot of the great discoveries, I would say, come from people making connections from data that seem to have nothing in common. Kind of like the apocryphal story of Isaac Newton watching an apple fall from the tree and then uh, making hypotheses about how the moon falls around the earth. It's amazing discoveries when people uh, blend and bring together disparate sources of information. The thing is, is we do our best thinking with data when we're able to do more than just calculate or filter or analyze or deduce. When we're able to feel our way through our data and chase our hunches and shift our perspectives and relate disparate sources of information that have never been brought together, we can come up with some pretty amazing answers. In fact, what happens is we have these questions, we get these answers, it leads to more questions, some more answers, and maybe a spark, and then a great insight comes from all of that. That's how it happens. And that's how it happens happened for a lot of the greatest minds in history. So if you're finding yourself working in an unpredictable way, feeling your way blindly through data, chasing unexpected results that maybe lead down a, an, a, an alley that ends and you go back on the path, that's okay. That's great. You're in good company. Great minds have been working like that for a very long time. Now keep in mind that these scientists and these people that we've been talking about, they don't own or monopolize this style of thinking. They exemplify it. They're emblems of great thinking and what thinking can do. In fact, most great thinkers, like all of us, sometimes don't even realize when we're going to be called on to bring our greatest thinking forward. In fact, this kind of improvisational thinking with data comes forward in situations where we're supposed to know everything, where every scenario has been planned for, where we have all the facts on the table. All of a sudden, boom, something happens and everything changes. Let me show you what I mean by showing you a little clip. We have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We had a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on a limb, which were meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. They're already here. up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15, and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. The ones on the limb are rounds. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. This just isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. Okay, people, listen up. People upstairs handed us this one, and we got to come through. We got to find a way to make this fit into the hole for this, using nothing but that. Let's get it organized. Okay, okay, let's build a filter. Maybe get some coffee going too, someone. Now we all know how that ends. They do find a way to put the square peg in the round hole, and the astronauts from Apollo, Apollo 13 come home safely. But aren't we all like characters in that scene, where contingencies that come up that we never even thought of and we have to do on the fly, ad hoc, great thinking, unexpected turn of events, make that report that got produced yesterday completely useless. We have to find new sources of data, new ways of feeling our way and chasing hunches, shifting perspectives. We're all like that. We're all great discoverers and problem solvers. And, and we can learn from other great problem solvers and discoverers. And there's another person I'd like to share a story about that used data and great thinking with data in a new way. His name, is, his name is David Stewart, and he's a well-known archaeologist and one of the brilliant people who deciphered the Mayan writing system. 
Here, uh, the, Mayan was, the Mayans were a great ancient civilization. About 1800 BC, BCE, they built incredible cities of stone and monuments and temples. They were incredible architects, artisans, and mathematicians. And their beautiful, incredible writing was everywhere. They had great records. The problem was that brilliant researchers for hundreds of years could not figure it out. Some of them even thought that this wasn't a language or a writing system. It was just pictures. But most researchers really believed there was a way to crack this code. And if it could be cracked, if it could be deciphered, incredible stories from this incredible ancient civilization could be discovered and learned by mankind for the first time. I should say humankind. And if they could crack it open, this would be one of the most important discoveries of archaeology in this century. But again, sadly, challenging. Brilliant researchers from universities all over the world were looking into this, and it was hard, hard stuff. Until David Stewart came along. Here he is at age four. His father was an archaeologist, so he got to play in um, ancient ruins. That was his playground. You know, I felt pretty lucky if I had a swing. <laughs> what an amazing experience. How fortunate for him then to have this incredible growth background and also then grow up to be an archaeologist just like dad. He was actually at age 22 when he made his great discovery. The thing that baffled people about the Mayan code was that it had 800 symbols. Now 800 symbols is not enough for each symbol to be a word, but it's way too many for it to represent sounds or letters like English, letters 26. 800 is far too many. So David just really was uh, interested in this problem. He, he really wanted to solve it and understand it. So he just started poring over it and looking at the data, piecing together things, moving things around, switching things around, changing his perspective, looking at other sources of data, other information about other civilizations at that time. And he had a spark. He had a spark of an insight, and he, ha he asked the breakthrough question. What if the Mayan writers were being artistic when they wrote? What if they were being improvisational when they wrote? What if it wasn't that there was one symbol for every sound or letter, but multiple symbols for every sound and letter, and Mayan writers could substitute in the ones that they wanted to use at the time and express themselves in an Im improvisational way? Well, that was the breakthrough insight. That is what made the code be cracked in working with a lot of other researchers as well. So for example, this is the, these are 11 symbols for the sound U or U. So you can see from looking at them that some of them are pretty abstract, some of them have some creatures. But in fact, a lot of them look pretty similarly. And you can see how maybe there was a little improvisation. I know my handwriting when I write isn't always so legible, so. Here's another example. This, these symbols all mean the same thing. They mean King Pakal. And again, what you're seeing is some, the symbols, you see some commonality, but some that are quite different. So the writers themselves could improvise with the language. In fact, David Stewart, we actually called him uh, when we prepared this speech and talked to him, and he told us that the improvisational part, the artistic flair to the language of the Mayan code, being able to improvise with the, with the symbols was as important as the structure of the language, which is pretty amazing because, or pretty funny, because that's exactly how David came across his discovery about their language. He had to be improvisational. He had to chase hunches about how, what these symbols mean. He had to feel his way through what these, what these Mayan writers were even feeling. And that's really what helped him crack the code and, and, and understand what these beautiful symbols really said to the world. Now each day our companies have, we all have our own Mayan code. Now it doesn't look like this, obviously. It looks more like this. It's a standard table of data. And if we can unravel the hidden meaning in it, we can be heroes. We can have a tremendous impact on our organizations, our institutions, on each other and on the world as lar at large. I'd like to show you some other heroes, data heroes, that may, and great thinkers that you've never heard of, that we've encountered at Tableau. 
The first one is Marie Ange Nani. Excuse my French accent. Uh, she's a project manager for business intelligence at the French Red Cross. Now, the French Red Cross is a massive organization. 54,000 volunteers to organize, 18,000 employees, and 2,000 locations where they provide services to their mission. Their mission being health, social, medical, educational welfare for their people. Humanitarian services are a big part of what they do. And of course, when there's a disaster, they have to be ready to spring into action. Now, information and data and systems about data are at the heart of what they do. When you have that many volunteers and that many employees, being able to move quickly and deploy them in the right kinds of ways and put resources where they're necessary, even for ongoing challenges, is a really important thing. For the French Red Cross, they had no easy way of analyzing data on the fly improvisationally. They had reports that they would run. Well, maybe it ran on Sunday, but a disaster or a change in, 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 the, in the country of France, something that would happen, would make that report irrelevant in just a couple days. What Marie wanted to do was make data available to people who could do great thinking at the right moment and make great things happen in time to help save people's lives and make their lives better. She wanted people to be able to work with data and think with data. So she wanted to be able to get them to answer questions that a regular report could never do. How many people were impacted? Where are the volunteers relative to that disaster or that situation? How do we deploy them? Who's already deployed? Who's available? Who's on vacation? These are all the kinds of questions that need to be answered very quickly around uh, catastrophic events and even ongoing um, social issues. Well, she brought in, uh, Marie brought in a way that the French Red Cross could make data more useful to the, to the people of the French Red Cross. Of course, the typical disciplines like HR and accounting were, and finance were served, but new people were served, volunteer captains. More employees had access to data. They could be far more effective allocating volunteers and budget to maximize the impact of their resources. In fact, one great story is that in just three weeks, the people working on the problem of the elderly homeless in Paris were able to come up with new ways to improve the quality and availability of housing. Now that's real impact, helping people find homes. Another great uh, example is Stephen Gehring, close to many of you in the education world. He's the chief academic officer at Spokane School District. He's a PhD and he had a hunch that data could help keep kids in school. He came to Spokane School District, which was a very a pretty large school district, 30,000 students, 3,500 employees, um, many troubled students, a poverty rate that is above average for the state of Washington, and worst of all, uh, a dropout rate of 33%. So only 67% of students were staying through high school graduation. He thought they could do better. And he thought the answer might be in data. He commissioned, he and his team commissioned a study of 7,000 students, former students and a few newer ones, and discovered that in fact, there were some early warning indicators in nearly every case that could have predicted this student was at risk. And he thought, well, what if we created an early warning system, dashboards, data, information, and put it in the hands of principals and teachers? Could we intervene earlier and prevent those students from dropping out and going down the path of leaving school? In fact, that's exactly what he did. I'm happy to say that in just two years, the dropout rate, um, closer to three years, the dropout rate went from um, 33% down to 20%, which is really pretty darn remarkable when you think about that. And what an incredible impact that is to have more students finishing high school, and many of them going on to college even. What an incredible impact for their lives and their families' lives, and even for the greater community. Stephen Gehring is a real data hero, I think. Let's switch to a different kind of hero, a little unconventional. Karaoke bars. Anybody a fan of karaoke? 
let's see. Uh, okay, good. Not, not so much me. Nobody asked me to ever karaoke, I have to admit. <laughs> this is a story about Nick Thistleston of Lucky Voice. He's the managing director of a small chain of karaoke bars in the UK. And he had an idea, a hunch, that they could manage their seven restaurants a little better, make it more fun, more profitable, but also make a better experience for their customers and their employees. Lucky Voice was looking to replace a typical sort of restaurant-oriented system with fixed reports, receipts at the end of the day, who worked, who was late, who was on time. Really not such great information to drive your business forward. He was looking to make more of the data that he had and he knew he could get access to. He wanted to answer questions like, how many people are booked into our karaoke bars? What do reservations look like next week? Who's working? Who's on vacation? What do are, what are their tip ratios look like? What are customers telling us in their surveys? What kind of comments are we getting? What songs are most popular? Those are all very important questions. In fact, uh, oddly enough, he made a discovery about New Year's Eve last year, maybe, or the year before, where he realized that 25% of the songs that were played on New Year's Eve were Gangnam style. Out of 100,000 songs they had on the machine, one out of four people was singing Gangnam Style. You know what he took with that little tidbit? He took it to the media. And guess what? The media picked up on it, and he got literally hundreds of thousands of free dollars in public relations. It was a great coup with a little bit of data to engage his audience. But not only that, not only was he able to design a system that helped, helped him use data better, he, shift, he changed the culture of the organization. He made data available to bartenders and waiters and waitresses and the managers in, a, in an active way. They designed an incentive system so they could look up their performance and see how many happy customers they had, how they were, how they were selling uh, against, uh, compared to their colleagues. So it really changed the culture to engage the employees to care about the direction of business. And of course, what's happened is the chain has grown, and they've made for a lot of happy customers and a lot happier employees. I think here, what's, what's amazing is these people, are they really any different than the people here in this room right now? I don't think so. They had a question, some data, software, in all those cases, Tableau, and curiosity, and a desire to think with data. They felt their way through their data. They chased ideas and hunches. They were just looking for answers. And I think all of us here, if we can unravel the meaning of our data, we can become data heroes like that as well. In fact, I know there are data heroes already amongst us. I just selected a few from the speaker panels. Here's Phil Lu Lubachek of Melissa Data, where his firm makes sure that address data makes for a delivered piece of mail. So not only making sure the message gets to the right people, but also reducing waste. We also have um, Carl Haberell. He's a well-known, uh, of Logic 20, well-known visualization expert. I think he led a session on project management yesterday. Andrew Percival of the Seattle Mariners. How cool to be an analyst that's helping our hometown team here in Seattle do better. And then finally, Sean Drew, director of information systems that worked on a UW campaign of fi uh, funding over $2 billion. You can't put a campaign to like that together unless you've got some pretty amazing data heroes making the systems and the data happen. I'd like to show you, in fact, a little more about some of the heroes we have here. I'd like to show you a demo of some of the Twitter data I saw yesterday um, and, and tell you a little bit about what I saw on the tweet, just to give you an example of how people like us can think with data. Let me show you. I'm going to give you a quick demo of Tableau. Very quick here. What I've got here, if it comes, oops. What I've got here is Tableau data, excuse me, Twitter data from our partner DataSift. Now, DataSift is, is captured every tweet. We went and we selected tweets about, um, about the conference yesterday. Let's look at the number of tweets that happened, about 150. Cool. How many uh, different people were tweeting? I'm kind of curious. Let's take a distinct count of so about 50 people tweeting. Let's go back to the tweets. I'm really kind of curious um, who tweeted, who tweeted what. Let's take a look and see. Let me just shift it this way and sort it that way. So Drive Exchange has done a tremendous amount of tweeting, but so has Oster Toaster. Is, is he here or she here? Oster Toaster? 
All right, a rock on. You're tweeting. You're putting it together for us here. Now, how much are you retweeting? Let's take a look. I'm going to find the retweet here, and let's put that on color. Cool. You're doing mostly your original tweets, which is great. Well, you can see a lot of people are also tweeting. Now, I had one more question about this data, and that is, how many people outside this community are we influencing with our tweeting? 100,000 people are being influenced by the tweets you're putting out there. That's a terrific thing for the Drive Conference and the mission that Drive is trying to do. Now, I do want to let you know that we put together a pretty nice dashboard on our website. Uh, which will be available at tableausoftware.com slash public slash drive2014. So you can take a look at some of these tweets at length and find out what's going out there. This is published with our free product called Tableau Public, and it's just a great way to explore the Twitter feed. Well, let me go ahead and get this going started again. The thing we're doing at Tableau is we're building tools, an application that allows people to do their best and greatest thinking with data. We want them to feel their way through data, drag and drop their way without thinking of the mechanics of the data. Chase hunches. Chase, like why is Lubbock County having trouble with donations? Why? Let's dig in. Does it have something to do with um, offices we have there? What's going on? So being able to chase a hunch. Being able to shift perspectives and see data in a new way. Bar chart, line chart, what have you. Let's see it in a new way. We can sometimes see new insights by new visual displays. And we love it when people can relate data. So maybe there's some trouble in Lubbock. Does that have something to do with the weather? Maybe it's too hot or too rainy for people to get out there and make their donations. These are all things that we think are important to great thinking. And it drives our mission um, to feel, to chase, to shift, to relate, to enable that kind of thinking. So whether you have concrete, unexplained data that's been troubling you for a long time to struggle, you struggle to understand the findings, or maybe you're someone who's seeking to expand the worlds of your organization and find new ways to do things, my question to you is, are you ready to take up the question of being a disciple, of disciple of great thinking, being a great thinker with data, feeling your way through, chasing hunches, shifting perspectives, and relating lots of different sources of information. The one thing I will say in closing is that it certainly is amazing to see such a huge crowd and to see a conference come from two years ago of 80 people to now over 456 of us here celebrating the power of data and great thinking. So are you ready to be the great thinkers? I'm going to say all signals say go. So thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to hearing any questions. So I think uh, I'm right. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again to our opening keynote, Alyssa Fink of Tableau. Let's give her another big round of applause today. I can't think of a better way to start our morning. And uh, kick off day two of Drive, we got another great group of sessions planned for you guys, so enjoy your morning. We'll have a break a little bit later, and we'll see you back here later this afternoon for our closing keynote.